We all know what a telescope is, right? It's a relatively simple device. Put a couple of mirrors inside a tube and you can see things that are really far away. Now, what if we take that simple design and make it so incredibly complex that it takes 25 years and $10 billion to create, and then once we're finally done, we launch the whole thing into deep space. That's what NASA did with the James Webb Space Telescope, and this is how it all went down. Let's establish a basic foundation on how a telescope actually works because the same principles apply whether you're doing simple backyard astronomy or exploring the deep universe from outer space. There are two basic telescope designs, refractive and reflective. The refracting telescope is one that you have to look straight through from the base, like in the famous illustrations of its inventor, Galileo Galilei. These work in a very similar way to a telephoto camera lens or a pair of binoculars. Layers of optical glass are used to bend the light rays, focus them, and then magnify to project an image into the viewer's eye. These are great optics, but the glass lenses create a physical limitation on how much light they can gather, making these lenses better suited for photography on Earth than astronomy in space. That leaves us with the reflecting telescope. Instead of transparent glass lenses, this design uses very carefully shaped mirrors to gather and focus light. In the most simple configuration, there are just two mirrors involved. This is the kind of telescope that you look into from the side, and this design was invented by Isaac Newton in 1668. It's got a big parabolic curved mirror, meaning it dips down in the middle. That primary mirror collects all of the light and focuses it into a secondary flat mirror that bounces the light up into an eyepiece. This is your average amateur astronomer telescope. A slightly more advanced version of the reflective telescope was then created by Laurent Cassegrain in 1667. It replaces the flat secondary mirror with a hyperbolic surface, meaning it bumps up in the middle, and this secondary mirror bounces the light straight back and focuses it through a hole in the center of the primary mirror and into the eyepiece or camera or any other type of imaging sensor. This design allows you to get higher magnification with a shorter tube length. In all reflective telescopes, the width of the primary mirror is the key to gathering light. That mirror is like a bucket that collects light, and then the secondary mirror is what focuses the light down into a magnified image. Now, if you took that Cassegrain telescope design that we just talked about, made it 14 feet wide by 43 feet long and weighing in at 11 metric tons, then launched it into Earth orbit, you'd have the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble's primary mirror is 2.4 meters across, that's 7 feet 10 inches, and that's big enough for the imaging sensors on Hubble to see deep into our Milky Way galaxy, and even distant galaxies far away in both space and time. Hubble also inadvertently highlighted one of the troubles with large reflective telescopes. The giant primary mirror has to be very precisely curved in order to perfectly focus all of that light down to a point where we can get a crystal clear image of something that is so incredibly far away. Hubble's mirror was not precisely curved, and the telescope made it all the way to a nearly 600 kilometer altitude orbit around the Earth before anyone figured out that the outer edge of the mirror was just a little bit too flat. By that, we mean it was off by 2,200 nanometers, which is 1 400th of a millimeter or 1 11,000th of an inch. That's important to remember for later. Anyway, that focus issue was a pretty big scandal at the time, but it was eventually fixed by sending astronauts up there with a big corrective lens for the telescope, and Hubble would go on to spend the next three decades creating all of these breathtaking images that you are seeing on the screen. But even with several component upgrades over time installed by astronauts on four different high-altitude spacewalks, the most recent and final service call being done in 2009, there's still something very important that the Hubble can't do. Now, if you've ever seen military night vision goggles or watched one of those ghost hunting TV shows, then you know what infrared vision looks like. In a massive oversimplification, it allows us to see differences in temperature. In slightly more specific terms, 
infrared light is electromagnetic radiation that exists in a wavelength longer than the human eye can see. When you look at the color red, you're seeing the longest wavelength of light that your eye can detect. Anything longer falls into the infrared spectrum. That's the opposite of ultraviolet light, which operates at wavelengths shorter than the eye can see. So if you look at the color purple, that is the shortest visible wavelength of light. Now, what's the point of all this? Well, even light that starts out as ultraviolet, such as light from a star, will shift towards infrared as it ages. And the cool thing about light is that it's infinite. It goes on forever, but it does change state along the way. It gets stretched out further and further into these infrared waves. So if we want to visualize the oldest light in the universe, light from the very first stars and galaxies and black holes at the very beginning of everything, then we need to go deep into the infrared spectrum. And this is the primary goal of the James Webb Telescope. All right, if we can understand all of that, then we can pretty easily start to understand how and why the James Webb Telescope does what it does. This was no easy task, though. NASA started development on the concept of a large infrared space telescope in 1996. It would not launch until Christmas Day 2021, and in the 25 years of development, James Webb would consume up to one quarter of NASA's entire astronomy budget. There are three key factors that made this particular telescope exponentially more difficult to build than any other telescope. Those are size, temperature, and distance. When it comes to size, we are looking at Webb's gigantic primary mirror, the iconic grouping of gold hexagon tiles. Webb is a reflective telescope, so we know that the larger the primary mirror, the more light the telescope can collect. And when it comes to imaging the deep universe, we need as much light as we can get. Picking out a distant galaxy at the edge of the cosmos is like spotting a Christmas light on the moon. The diameter of previous space telescopes like Hubble were limited by the width of the rockets they were launched on. Most orbital rockets can carry a payload with around 5 meters diameter, so in order for Webb's mirror to reach the necessary 6.5 meter diameter, it needed to adopt a foldable design. This is where the hexagons come in. Not only does the honeycomb design allow the mirror to fold in on itself for storage during launch, those individual panels will then be used to dial in the exact curvature of the mirror itself. Not only can each hexagon precisely adjust its own angle, there's also a piston under the center of the tile that can push or pull to fine tune the curvature. If we remember, the shape of Hubble's mirror being off by just a couple thousand nanometers was equivalent to a catastrophic failure, so the level of precision control needed is so incredibly precise and delicate, yet also needed to survive being blasted into space on an Ariane 5 rocket. James Webb was placed on a giant shaker table during pre-launch testing to simulate the vibrations of a supersonic flight through Earth's atmosphere. It was then moved into an acoustic chamber where the violent sound waves of a rocket engine ignition were blasted into the components. Everything had to survive the test in perfect working order. Each one of those tiles is made from a very rare and expensive metal called beryllium. It was chosen for a unique combination of lightweight, high strength, and resistance to extreme temperature. However, beryllium is not a reflective metal, which is why each hexagon receives an ultra-thin coating of gold just 0.1 microns thick. All of the gold on Webb's mirror put together would only weigh as much as a golf ball. Now, gold is not a particularly good reflector of visible light, but it is an excellent reflector of infrared light, and it's also non-reactive, meaning that it won't dull or tarnish over time. Webb's secondary mirror, the one at the end of the long tripod structure, is also coated in gold for the same reason. The secondary mirror focuses all of the light back into the center of the telescope. This is like the Cassegrain design, but Webb actually goes one step further and adds a tertiary mirror, making it a three-mirror anastigmat, meaning that there's a third mirror below the main dish that reflects the light yet again before it reaches the imaging sensors. Actually, there's even a fourth mirror in there, but it's only used for image stabilization. Anyway, we won't get too deep into those weeds. 
Our second factor we have to deal with is temperature. Since James Webb is trying to find the faintest sign of electromagnetic radiation from the ancient universe, it needs to block out all the much closer and more intense radiation blasting out from our sun. Otherwise, it's like trying to see the stars from the middle of a city. Doesn't work. Just like a turtle, James Webb carries its primary defense on its back, the sun shield. This is five giant layers of ultra-thin material named Kapton. It's a transparent plastic film that's typically used to make flexible circuit boards. The standout feature of Kapton is that it's stable at temperatures all the way from negative 269 degrees Celsius to positive 400 degrees Celsius. The outer two layers of the sun shield are the thickest at 0.05 millimeters, while the thin layers are just 0.025 millimeters. To prevent light from coming through, each layer is coated with 100 nanometers of aluminum, and then the outer two layers get an additional 50 nanometer coating of silicon, which is an element that doesn't retain heat, it reflects the sun's radiation back out into space. This is how the entire multi-layer shield operates. Heat is trapped into the voids between layers and channeled out to the sides away from the telescope's instruments. The effect of the sun shield is a temperature differential of 83 degrees Celsius on the sun facing side and negative 233 degrees on the dark side. It's a totally passive cooling system that requires no energy or maintenance. The only downside is the vulnerability of the capped on layers to micrometeorite strikes, which is a high probability out there in space. It is inevitable that the shield will be punctured, but in order to prevent a tear in the material from spreading, the layers are built in segments, with seams in between that will act as rip stops. The only active cooling system on James Webb is specifically for the mid-infrared instrument, or MIRI. This needs to operate at negative 267 degrees Celsius, which is just 7 degrees Kelvin, Zero degrees Kelvin is absolute zero, the coldest temperature that can possibly exist in the universe, and the reason that Miri needs to be so cold is to reduce noise, not sound noise, but image noise. Do you ever try to take a photo or video in a really dark room? You get all this grainy kind of static, like artifacting all over the picture. That is what we call noise in the sense of a digital image, and it reduces the amount of detail that we are able to capture with a camera. When it comes to infrared images, any amount of excess heat around the sensor will create noise that will reduce the detail. Even the movement of the atoms vibrating inside the material that the MIRI is made of can create enough infrared energy to interfere with the image. So, by cooling the material down to nearly absolute zero, we slow down the movement of the atoms to the point where they can't create any noise. In order to achieve this active cooling, the MIRI is equipped with an insane cryocooler that was invented specifically for this application. It costs NASA $150 million just for this one component alone. The third factor that NASA has to contend with to operate James Webb is distance. This telescope is really far away from the Earth. The ISS is 400 kilometers above Earth's surface. Hubble Telescope is 570 kilometers. The moon is 384,000 kilometers away, and James Webb is sitting at 1.5 million kilometers. This is one of the key reasons why the materials team had to prioritize lightweight elements for the telescope's mirror and sun shield. When launching a rocket from the Earth, you have to make a choice between distance and weight. You can send a very heavy thing over a short distance, or a very light thing over a long distance, but you can't have both, not yet at least. The destination for Webb is Lagrange Point 2. A Lagrange Point is a very complicated product of orbital physics. The simplified way to look at it would be a point in space where the gravity of the Earth and the gravity of the Sun equals out and will essentially just pull any low mass object at this point along with them, so the locations of these Lagrange points and any objects situated there will remain constant relative to the position of the Sun and the Earth. The location where we parked James Webb is called L2. It's in the shadow of the Earth hidden from the Sun, which is actually not good for the telescope because it needs sunlight for power. NASA has used small nuclear power sources on deep space probes like Voyager and even the latest generation of Mars rover 
but James Webb demands more power than these decaying isotopes can offer, so it has a solar panel array on the bottom segment that sits outside the sun shield. This is called the bus. It also houses the communication systems for sending and receiving information to Earth. So, in order for James Webb to get the necessary sun exposure, it actually orbits around the L2 point, which is where the physics is very complicated, so we are staying out of those weeds too. The downside here is that James Webb does need a reaction control system to maintain its position in space. There are 20 rocket thrusters in 8 modules, 2 modules at each corner. These are hypergolic rocket engines, meaning they use self-combusting propellants, and this is what will eventually lead to the death of James Webb. There are 191 liters of hydrazine fuel and 95 liters of nitrogen tetroxide oxidizer on board the telescope. When that liquid runs out, we lose the ability to control Webb's position. Originally, it was thought that James Webb would only have about 10 years worth of fuel on board, but after an easier than expected orbital insertion and overall very efficient operations so far, it's now believed that Webb can operate for up to 20 years. Another way that James Webb conserves fuel is by using reaction wheels. These are how astronomers fine-tune the exact direction that the telescope is pointing, and they do this without burning any rocket fuel. The reaction wheels are spinning metal disks that use reaction torque to manipulate the angle of the telescope. It's like when you see a motorcycle rider flying through the air off a big jump. They can use the bike's acceleration and braking in mid-air to control the angular momentum of the wheels, which will influence the pitch angle of the motorcycle. That is the biggest downside to the James Webb telescope though, its distance. The Hubble is close enough to reach with a refueling mission, and that was last done on one of the final space shuttle missions in 2009, allowing it to operate until at least 2030, making four decades of total lifespan. That's pretty exceptional for a space-based instrument. With our current vehicle lineup, we don't have anything that could reach the James Webb to link up and refuel, so it would be limited to a couple of decades, but that also gives us a very long time to figure out a new vehicle that is even more capable than the shuttle, like the SpaceX Starship, for example. So there's potential that NASA can get even more out of their $10 billion investment. And that kind of brings us to what the future might hold for the Space Telescope. The general consensus is that in order to go beyond the capabilities of the James Webb, we would need to start building space telescopes in space, meaning that we eliminate the extra limitations and complications presented by stuffing them into a rocket and blasting off from the Earth's surface. The potential of orbital manufacturing is something that we haven't even begun to scrape the surface of. There's also the far side of the moon, it's not perpetually dark, but it does spend a full 14 Earth days in the lunar night protected from both sunlight and interference from the Earth, so that could be an ideal location to build a future deep space observatory. But until then, we can enjoy everything that the James Webb Telescope is able to provide for modern astronomy, which is something that we haven't even talked about yet, but that's a whole other video.